So hello everyone, my name is Becky Robinson. I'm from Weaving Influence and I'm so happy to be with Alex Ferobieff today as we uh, talk together about the concepts from his book, Transform Your Company, Escape Frustration, Align Your Business and Get Your Life Back. I would like to sign up for all three of those uh, items in the subtitle today and I imagine if you're joining us today, it's because you have the same wishes. So welcome to all of you around the world and thank you for joining us. I I want to take a quick moment to introduce Alex Vorobiev. He is the founder and CEO of the Vorobiev Company, and it is a premier business consulting organization. Alex is also a highly sought after speaker and business alignment coach, and he has a great podcast. And uh, in his career, Alex has helped scores of companies eliminate the real source of their frustrations using business alignment tools. And that's a uh, term he coined after years of working with and investigating different business systems. So I am thrilled to learn with Alex today. And again, I'm so glad that you've joined us. Welcome, Alex. Hi, Becky. Thanks for having me. <laughs> sure thing. So before we dive into the content today, what we want to do is get some feedback from those of you on the call. And uh, this is a really interesting question. I can't wait to see the response. Um, and the question for you on the poll today is, have you ever been stuck in a dysfunctional organization? So if you could take a quick moment and give us your feedback on this poll. Um, I have to tell you, I see the results are exactly what I would predict, but I'm not going to give anyone anything away. Uh, I'm going to let everyone answer uh, this poll. And apparently, uh, I can't vote. You cannot vote, Alex. But curious, have you ever been stuck in a dysfunctional organization? Ironically, yes, I have. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I'm going to give folks a couple of seconds. It looks like um, about 60% of you have answered the poll. And uh, I'm going to give you a couple of more seconds to put in your vote. And to that one soul who has never been stuck in a dysfunctional organization, I would love to hear from you after. <laughs> Seems miraculous. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and close up that poll. Thanks to those of you who have uh, shared your results. It looks like 98% uh, of you have been stuck in the past in a dysfunctional organization, or maybe you are stuck currently. And only one amazing soul on this call has never been stuck in a dysfunctional organization. So Alex, I'm curious. I'm sure you've shared this question with others. How, how do these results line up with other results you've seen? They, they tend to line up pretty well, except we have the chosen one today with us, which, which is exciting and, and hopefully we'll give them the tools to handle it if they ever do end up in a dysfunctional company, whether they're owning it, leading it, or just working in it. Thanks so much, Alex. So as we dive in today, I would uh, love to start with this question, you know, from the results, it's obvious that people have experienced a lot of dysfunctions in their work life. And I would love to hear from you, Alex. What do you see as the main cause of dysfunction in companies? And please don't say the boss. Well, it came over time. And I started out my career cleaning up companies. I was a CPA and a cleanup CFO. And I'd go and clean up the numbers. And it was fun. It was always sort of a puzzle to figure it out. And once you could get things in a spreadsheet and understand where a company was losing or making money and how much it owed and what its prospects were, a lot of times it wasn't as bad as is initially thought, especially when you could see where it was bleeding. But I found even after cleaning up the numbers and doing this a number of times and getting more involved with the company over time beyond just the numbers, that I was really just treating the symptoms there was always more to the story besides it wasn't making money or it wasn't making as much as it, it thought it should. There was always this kind of this dysfunction that was inevitably below the surface that spreadsheets don't fix. And so it got me thinking about, well, what is it? Why, why are these companies dysfunctional and they're having these financial issues or challenges? And a lot of times people within the company were really frustrated. And, and it, it was gnawing at me. And over time during my career, I got more involved in companies. I led a company that I had cleaned up and I had the same frustration issues and it became dysfunctional. And it led me on a long journey to find out what it was. And it actually didn't really crystallize 
until a, a moment on a Saturday morning when I was really frustrated. And it actually, it happened at, um, ironically, one of the most, the happiest place on earth. I was the most frustrated, just dealing with dysfunctional organizations. And I thought I'd share the story. So it might, might, for people that can identify with it, I was with my wife and daughter at Disneyland. It was a Saturday morning and they could tell I was frustrated. I had brought, brought work home with me and I wasn't letting it go. And they, they decided to go on a ride and they said, why don't you finish your coffee and we'll go on a ride. So I was watching the canoe ride at Disneyland and I saw it start to leave the dock. And I saw the, the guy from Disney paddling really hard at the front of the dock or at the front of the boat. And I saw the, the guests from Disney, it was kind of a motley crew and some were paddling, some weren't, some were kind of paddling against things. And there's someone in the back from Disney helping, but it's like, wow, how long can that last? And it kind of reminded me of some of the companies I had dealt with over time, but it didn't last very long. The, the Disney leader got the boat off to the side and he turned, turned around, he stood up and turned around. In about 90 seconds, he got this crew of people all working and coordinating their efforts in the same direction. And it was, it was shocking. He stood up and he, he lifted up his paddle and he, and he showed it and goes, this is your fun stick. This is how you hold it. You hold one hand here and you hold one hand here and you put it forward and you pull it back. He said, it's important you understand how to do that because there's three rules you got to know on this boat. Number one, if we don't row, we don't go. Hmm. And number two, don't splash. Other people in the boat don't like it. And the water used to be green, but or used to be blue, but it's not anymore. And finally said, don't stand up in the boat. Only a trained fool stands up in the boat. Mm -hmm. Or only a fool stands up in a boat, but luckily I'm a trained fool. And he said, look, we want to row together. We're inevitably, we're going we're to do some things. So we row together, but inevitably we're going to get out of sync and we need to coordinate our efforts. And we got some songs and we'll do that. We'll take some breaks, but if we do this right, it'll be less than 10 minutes and it'll be fun. And bam, in 90 seconds, he got this motley crew going in the same direction. And I thought, how many times I'd seen like the leader truck do, doing everything on their own and people not really knowing what they can do to contribute. Some people contributing, paddling forward, and some people not realizing they're, they're paddling the wrong direction. And that's what led me and I noticed that originally with the symptoms of these companies, they weren't on the same page. They weren't coordinating their effort. And that's what led me to business alignment and finding that root cause of the dysfunction. And that most times businesses, they don't coordinate their actions. And there's, there's some, actually some scientific reasons why they don't do that and how we're wired and from a physiological standpoint. So we're going to explore that today. Yeah, I, I would love to hear more about that, Alex. I'm curious why you think it's so difficult for people to align their efforts. And, you know, maybe you can give us a bit of background on what business alignment is and why it's so critical. Yeah, and we're going to start, we're going to start actually with the brain, because most people in organizations have one. <laughs> and, and why alignment is important. And when you start to understand the brain, you'll start to understand that we're actually by default, we're, we're set up to have dysfunctional organizations because our non-conscious drives us. Most of what our brain does, it does below the surface. You're not thinking about it. Your brain's just automatically doing it. It's how you could drive to work today and you talk on the phone or listen to the radio and not realize, gee, how did I get to work? Well, your non-conscious took care of it. It knew what to do. But there's a lot going on in the brain. There's about 11 million bytes of information that your brain is processing every second. That's more than a supercomputer. And this comes from the Academy of Brain-Based Leadership and a neuroscientist and psychologist put this together and helping leaders understand their brains. But our brain, it's processing 11 million bytes of information. Only 40 of them are processed consciously. So everything else, our brain just 
it just decides. It's kind of got some pre-wired things in there. It sees the world in a certain way and just going to make a decision without really asking you. Because one, it takes a lot of energy to, to contemplate things, to say, well, what should I do? It's a lot easier for your brain to just go, we're just going to do that. Don't worry about it. So there's a lot going on underneath the surface. So just for an individual, they're going to do things non-consciously. Now you take that and you add five people in a team or a hundred people in a company. That's a very, they're doing a lot of things non-consciously. How do you coordinate the effort? Just like the people on that canoe ride, they had to coordinate their effort, but in order to get them to do that, they had to show them how to do it, how they were going to do that. And that takes conscious processing. So you got to turn on that part of the brain. And that's why alignment's important. So we talked at the beginning of the hour about the business alignment tools that you've been working with companies to implement. Can you tell us about some of the tools that you uh, share with your clients or with the organizations you serve? Absolutely. Because one of the things I would do is I clean up the numbers. Over time, I started to realize, gee, something's missing. We need to get these people on the same page. And I started to come across different systems and books that try to get people on the same page to coordinate their actions. And one of the first ones I came across was the E-Myth, which is directed towards really small businesses. They're trying to figure out their business model. But instead of just doing and working in the business, this book helps, helps um, leaders and owners of companies to define what is the ideal way to coordinate the efforts within a company. And there are many others, and we're going to talk about some in more detail today, but you might have heard about some of these that we'll touch on. And if you have questions about them, please feel free to, uh, to put in a question. Hey, I got a question. Or I want to talk about this one. And I have podcasts on a number of these. Today, I got one coming out on scaling up and next week, one on traction where I'm interviewing people who, who are working with these systems so that you can hear hear what their experiences are. But these are just just a small dose of business alignment tools. And it took me a while to name them because I would suggest things. And one of my clients early on says, well, how do I know it's the best? And what is it? And I had suggested EOS traction. And I didn't know what to call it. It really wasn't a planning system in a management system kind of gets everyone's eyes glazed over. So what is it? And as I was looking at these different tools, I started to notice a pattern and it, it jumped out at me. And that's what I'm going to share with you today because you're going to see what the common thread is with these business alignment tools. Number one is they, they align companies. And I was actually, I came across it. I had a moment when I was reading the great game of business. It's a great book. And it's a book about how a company that was literally going to go out of business, a factory, how it was able to survive by aligning themselves. And Becky, do I got a chance? How are we doing on time? Can I share the story on it? Oh, please share. Yeah, I want yeah. to hear. I, I don't know about, about the others listening, but when I see all those books, I think, oh my goodness, like how would I ever have time to read those all? So hearing what's inside is really helpful. <laughs> yeah, and we're going to, we're going to, give you something so you can understand them as well as, hey, which one's the right one for my company? Uh, We're going to cover all that. But the great game of business, I like it because it came out of, it was, came out of necessity. International Harvester was going to shut down an overhaul facility in Springfield, Missouri, back in the early 80s. And that was going to wipe out the town. And the leader, the manager decided, hey, we're going to raise money and we're going to try to buy the fact buy this uh, facility and make it our own business because otherwise the town's going to go out of business. International Harvester wanted nine million dollars for the equipment, and they could only raise a hundred thousand dollars. This was back in the early '80s when interest rates were phenomenally high, and so they had no room for air. Their hundred thousand was equity. There, there was no extra cash, and the leader thought, okay, how am I going to get everybody from the the leadership team all the way down to the people doing the overhauls, the hourly workers, 
we can't have one bad day. We have to have, everyone has to have a good day every day. We can't afford a $10,000 mistake. And so what he, what he figured was, well, when I played basketball, if everyone knew the score, they, they align their efforts in order to achieve, to, to help us win. And so what if we made it so everyone knew the score of the overall game and what they could, could do to contribute? And this company, which if it had one bad week, would probably have been out of business. It went on from, from being 16 million in revenue. Within 10 years, it was at 25 million. That initial 100,000 in equity became 25 million. That they reached their goal of having everyone in the company being able to have a paid for house. They reached that in 20 years. They were able to do this because they aligned their efforts. And as I read the book, it was really clear. The fundamental purpose behind the great game of business was making sure various parts of the organization are in alignment. And as you see, I was like, oh, yeah, that sounds familiar because I've seen some of this in other things. And to do that, to build a great company, you ask hard questions. And that's what you're going to see in these books, that it's all about aligning efforts by asking questions, important questions to align efforts, that if you don't answer these questions, then your brain, it's going to fill in the gaps. And the other person's brain that's working with you, they're going to fill in the gaps and probably not the same way you did. So that's where it gets our brain, that very small bit of conscious processing activated in a coordinated way by asking questions. Mastering the Rockefeller Habits is another one that Vern Harnish is a business alignment tool. And it came out uh, over 10 years ago, maybe more. And when you look at the first two habits, they distilled it down from Rockefeller and how he was the richest American uh, at his time and inflation and Justin might've been the richest American, but they distilled down his business habits and how he built successful companies to 10. And the first two habits were one, the executive team is healthy and aligned. And two, everyone is aligned around the number one thing to move a company forward. I don't know about you, but I know I've worked with a lot of organizations and I've asked them that question. You know, what's the most important thing right now in the company? And when you have gaps in those answers, even small ones, just with the leadership team, that means when they come together, they all kind of, they're, they're paddling in a different direction. And especially when they leave, if they think this is the most important thing and someone else thinks that's the most important thing, that doesn't usually lead to highly functioning organizations. But it's, it's kind of the default because, hey, our brains, they're making a lot of decisions on their own. That's the way we're wired in order to survive. And when, in addition to talking about alignment and the 10 habits, there's also three questions that are important within mastering the Rockefeller habits. Do we have the right people? Are they doing the right things? And are we doing those things right? So again, it's about alignment and using questions and those answers to start to get people to make conscious decisions and eventually non-conscious decisions that are in alignment with what's important for the company. Those are really good questions. <laughs> It, and that's, there, there's not, that's the, one of the takeaways here is if you don't have answers to important questions, it's, it's a lot harder, but it's, it's really questions. They, they, so Socrates started it out in terms of asking good questions. Unfortunately, I think it got him killed because he asked too many good questions, but questions are important. And when those answers are really clear and they start to get in the non-conscious of people, you're gonna get more coordinated effort. It doesn't happen by accident. Patrick Lencioni, some of you might have heard about him. He wrote Five Dysfunctions of the Team. He likes to write a lot of parables. And he's been inside all kinds of amazing companies and companies that weren't as amazing. But he found that the days of a competitive advantage are really over. Things are moving so fast, people are able to copy and compete on such a quick basis that having a, a moat around your strategy is pretty rare, that the only real competitive advantage 
is the ability to have a healthy team and that's coordinating their efforts, that they're all on the same page. And he said, hey, it's about being unambiguously aligned around a common set of answers to a few critical questions. So it wasn't, again, you've seen probably seen the pattern from the other books and it's like, well, what are these critical questions? They're really pretty simple. Why do we exist? What's the purpose of the company? If it's just to enrich the owner, that's okay. But if everyone's understand, hey, we're here just to enrich the owner, that changes the financial and emotional compensation within a company compared to a company that has additional reasons for existing. And the other uh, five questions are relatively simple, but you also notice number five is what is most important right now? Because again, it, it, it's about coordinating people's efforts. And if we go back to our canoe ride there, if it really isn't clear to those people on the canoe ride, what what the most important thing is paddling around the island it's not going to happen that well and so getting people on the same page and that's one of the things i recommend to people regardless of what their position is in the company if you feel a company's out of alignment and a little dysfunctional ask that question and ask it in a nice way but it's it's a way to start the conversation because when people have real differing views on what's what's the most important thing Generally, yeah, it ends up where, where we had 98% of us were in, the, um, were in the dysfunctional boat or have been, and that, that's one of the reasons. So, Alex, I've got a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, who would you say owns defining or answering these questions in an organization? Is it, you know, is it the president of the company? Is it the executive team? Is it everyone on the team? You know, how much interaction should there be around these questions? Well, it's best for it to come from the ultimate leader. However, that's not always the case. And where it's the leader, what I always say, it's to the person that's listening to this. It's either leading their department, their division, their, their small team, or if it's just them, you know, they're a team of one, they can start answering their questions because they can use those answers like, hey, my, what I think is most important right now is this. And, and having that conversation, asking the question and seeing where the dialogue goes in an open, objective manner, that's where you, you start to get people to engage that conscious, conscious part of their brain because everyone's just naturally stuck in their non-conscious. And you get them, get them, it's great for the leader to do it and to set the tone. But unfortunately, that does, that's not always the case, as the 98% point out. So it's all about engaging that conscious part of the brain. That's helpful. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> sure. Yeah, a couple more, and then we'll, we'll move on to how to pick the right one for you. But scaling up is a very popular one now. And it was from Vern Hardish. It's kind of the evolution of Rockefeller habits. And guess what? It was designed to drive alignment right from them and how did they do it well there were questions and for them there were seven basic questions you needed to answer you know who's going to do what when how why and one of the things i like about theirs is what shouldn't you shouldn't do in order to be successful and so again it's all about driving alignment through the answers to to important questions so Alex, as I'm listening to you and as a business owner myself, like I'm drawn to all these tools. So how can those who are watching or uh, watching later, how can we tell which is the right alignment tool for you know, the organization in which we work? Well, that's why we have the next slide. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, and that, that was kind of an issue because I, I love like you, I love concepts and I call them business improvement concepts. And I've been to a lot of events where you hear a speaker talk about uh, their system and their tools and man, it's going to solve everything. I mean, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And what I found was they really fit better with organizations depending on where they're at. 
especially where the leader's at. And it ended up boiling it down to there's three sort of categories for a company when they're selecting their tool. And one's starting up. You know, it's a natural thing. Okay, we're starting a business. And we mentioned the e-myth. There's also built to sell, which both take a different way in a, using a parable or a fictional tale of how a business owner thought about their business and developed a better business model that wasn't dependent on them and that could grow beyond their capabilities uh, or hourly capabilities. And so that's starting up. So if you're really struggling for what your business model is and how you're going to do things and it's overly, overly reliant on the business owner, I recommend starting up tools and that would be the e-myth and built to sell. And then the second category is what I call stuck. And that's where a lot of companies are. And unfortunately, that's not what all of these tools are written for. Most companies that are looking for something are stuck. But that's a lot of times the leaders having some challenges and people within the organization really have different views about what's most important, how they're going to be successful. And so, and this one might also be for management teams that they're not, they're not really into making their brain hurt, trying to figure out the most advanced concept, concepts. So these stuck ones, one of the most popular one is traction. EOS, it's also called EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System. And it, through questions, helps you align the company and get people on the same page. And they've really focused it at that size of company that they're no longer a startup. They either have a leadership team or they need one. And helping them that they might not have had that experience of growing a company, but helping them get on the same page and get some, get some traction. So that's the stuck one. And in stuck, I also recommend the advantage by Patrick Lencioni, which is very, it's a very high level um, concept, but it's, it revolves around those six questions and communicating the answers to them. It's a good starting point, especially for a stuck company, because at least gets the conversation started. So Alex, when you talk about stuck, are you talking about, you know, being financially stuck, like maybe revenues at a certain level, you want to grow beyond it, or are you talking about stuck in terms of that relational dynamic that might be going on in an organization? They, they seem to run together. <laughs> so often I've seen companies where hey, the new car smells worn off, it's 10, 20 years in. Revenues, they've, we call it flatlined. The revenues, they're not growing anymore and they're probably in a slight decline and at least profitability is. And they're not moving forward. And a lot of times when they try to bring in A players, those A players leave. And so they're, they're stuck from momentum and also financially. Thanks. <laughs> sure. And then finally, what I call striving. And, and this, is, this is kind of the ironic uh, one is that a lot of business tools are really directed towards striving leaders. However, that's kind of the most, that's the smallest percentage of leaders in terms of really they want to, they want to get the, the most advanced concepts. They're willing to make their brain hurt. The team around them is that, that is a smaller percentage of the world, but a lot of systems are directed towards that. Or they assume that, hey, our system's so good, it's going to make people who are stuck, help them get, break their behavioral patterns, help them engage that conscious part of their, mem their, their brain, and just get them going and get them, get them momentum. However, that's, that's not always the case. And you take scaling up, we were talking about a second ago. Since I started, was aware of scaling up, in recent years, they've really started I, I thought it was for more advanced uh, leadership team. They've now focused it and said, look, we're for companies that, that are, I think it's more than 25 million and uh, larger companies, hundreds of employees, and they, they are focused on the middle market. They used to be kind of focused for everybody. 
and we come across people that had three, four people and they were trying to implement scaling up. It really wasn't designed for them. And it, it wasn't their fault that it was really challenging to implement with a team that really had no business experience. So striving is a lot of times you're going to see tools that are striving tools and maybe that's the next tool for you after moving up from starting up or stuck. Got it. So uh, let's just make sure I'm understanding and tracking with you. Um, you're in an organization, you really want to create more business alignment. You identify where you are, you know, either the startup or the stuck or the striving. You pick a tool and you implement it. Um, that seems, you know, easy enough. So is there something that I'm missing? Well, this, this is what, as I recommended systems to clients, some of them worked and they, they implemented and pow, they were on their way. And others, the same system, another company, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't get them any momentum. I remember watching one client who had implemented a popular system, had a coach help them implement it. And we, they answered the questions and we were about three months in and he looked up from the summary of answers and I could just tell it had not, it was not clicking with him. And that was, it was frustrating. I'm like, why is that? And it, I'd seen other companies do that as well. And that led me on a journey. And also one thing to save you time and money. Awesome. Because because there is a huge assumption in all these business tools, and not just alignment tools, but pretty much any business improvement tool is the thing with alignment. And if you get if you had a tool that just improved your hiring, they all assume you're going to watch and see if it works or not. And if it doesn't work, and most things don't work perfectly at the start, that you're going to be willing to adjust things. And that's a huge assumption. And Business alignment tools, they ask a lot of important questions. Who's going to do what, when? So you start to, to figure out, okay, what's going to happen? Well, inevitably, one month in, one quarter in, it all doesn't go according to plan. And alignment tools start to generate feedback. And that's starting to help, okay, what did we expect to happen? And we're going to go do this. Now, what happened? That's feedback. And now... Now we get it back to our friend, the brain, because feedback, in order for it to be of use, you have to engage what they call the executive brain, the prefrontal cortex. And the executive brain is where those 40 bytes of information are processed. But you have to consciously turn it on. Your default mechanism, your brain wants to dismiss feedback, especially if it doesn't line up with how the brain looks at the world because the brain looks at the world a certain way. Hey, we got a good product or we're a good company. Well, if you're getting feedback from the outside world that, yeah, your product's not that good or your price is not that good, it's a lot easier. Your brain's going to default want to dismiss that. It takes your executive brain to really engage it and process it. So Alex, can we pause for a moment? I have another poll that we want to launch and get mm -hmm. some engagement from our attendees. And uh, we would like to know about your relationship to feedback. Um, we're talking about the importance of feedback in creating business alignment. So um, we're asking you today, how would you describe or define your relationship to feedback? Do you have a healthy relationship to feedback? Uh, meaning you welcome it, you're open to it, uh, you are uh, influenced by it. Uh, do you have an unhealthy relationship to feedback? So maybe you... Um, you don't like it, you don't want to listen to it, you're not open, are you neutral about feedback or do you really not know? Um, so if you could take a moment to vote, how would you define your relationship to feedback? And uh, thanks to those of you who are answering, I appreciate it. Alex, do you have any different ways that you would uh, explain or define a, a healthy or unhealthy relationship to feedback? Uh, because I, I would guess that a lot of times it's mixed depending on who's delivering the feedback or how they're delivering it. Absolutely. Let me, let me walk you. Th Let's walk through first what is feedback and then you can see, you can see for yourself um, how a bad relationship can develop. And sure. so we all take an action. So with business alignment, hey, we're going to start the quarter and we want to sell this amount in, in product. 
So we, we go and we take action and there's a certain effect. Okay. Now we take that back as feedback and go, okay, what are we going to, is there something we should change? So maybe you didn't hit the sales number. Okay. So a healthy relationship with feedback is, okay, what do we need to do differently? Is it our people? Is it our processes? Is it our product? Is it our pricing? By engaging and questioning, you're using that 40 bytes, that limited amount of processing power of your executive brain to think about what action are you going to take next. Now, our brain by default, those other 10.9 million bytes, it just wants to keep going. It's a lot easier to dismiss it. Ah, it was rainy this quarter. Ah, our competitor played dirty last quarter. It's a lot easier to do that than to think about, okay, what do we want to do? What should we do? What did we learn? And what should we do differently? And that, because that's, it's not the default state of us in our brains to question things. Our, our brain would much rather just make a non-conscious decision over it. So let me um, share the results of the poll. Uh, sure. It looks like about 67% of you have a healthy relationship to feedback, uh, only 2% uh, with unhealthy and 28% uh, neutral, 4% uh, unknown. And Lynn is uh, mentioning in the chat here that she has a healthy relationship to feedback based on non-biased data, but often it's subjective or not supported by specific examples, uh, which is more challenging. Yeah, how feedback is given is a big issue. And one of the things that happens is when our brain feels threatened, it, it reacts. In the lower part of our brain, which we're going to talk about, it wants to protect us. It doesn't like pain. And one of the ironic things is the same part of our brain that fires when we're in physical pain is the same part of the brain that's firing when we're in emotional pain. And our brain wants pain to stop. And so we're kind of wired to avoid the pain. And it's a lot easier to... It, you always want objective feedback, but it's rare that something's purely objective. I work a lot with numbers. You can make numbers do a lot of things. Uh, you can play with the scale of a graph. There's a lot of things you can do to try to that sometimes uh, make it not as objective as it can be. But one of the things I found with feedback and on my journey with it is a lot of negative feedback is never given because people don't want to hear it. And what I found is the absence of any feedback, that's negative feedback in itself because it's a lot easier for people to go, yeah, he's got an issue, but he doesn't want to deal with it. It happened to me until somebody told me my issue and how I dealt with things when it didn't go well. And it opened my eyes to that. And so if you're not hearing any feedback, uh, take that as a sign that maybe people don't want to express it to you. So let's talk a little bit about the symptoms of having an unhealthy relationship with feedback. What does that look like? How does it show up? Sure. Poor relationship with feedback. So our brain, the, those 11, 10.9 million bytes and change that are processing things, remember that's every second, it wants to respond to things that don't fit with its view of the world very quickly. And so that's what comes out with blame and anger and uh, denial of things. And some of you that the 98% that worked in dysfunctional organizations, maybe you've noticed sometimes leaders don't really want to hear it. And one of the poster childs for today, uh, Harvey Weinstein, and what he's accused of is, is horrific but from a company standpoint, the stories that have come out is his brother who worked, with, worked in the company, he knew. Uh, people within the organization knew at the senior level, but they couldn't, they couldn't give that feedback. And it was, they were in a self-protection mode or doing something there. But that's what a poor relation with feedback was, is he's not getting the message. And it's not just him. Companies like Wells Fargo. Hey, people don't want your credit card. Um, I've banked with them for 30 years, but I, I don't want the credit card unless I ask for it. 
And United Airlines had an issue with feedback when it drugged that poor passenger off its plane in terms of not dealing with, with things um, and having competing, uh, competing efforts within a company. And the, that poor guy, he felt the blunt of it. Uh, it might be that Tesla right now might not be handling feedback well. So it happens a lot. I know that GE, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal how it was a very successful company and Jack under Jack Welch and under the, the CEO that took over for him, the Wall Street Journal described it as they started to have success theater. They would talk about everything they were doing well, but they didn't want to talk about the problems. And when the CEO left, the billion dollars in additional write-offs and losses came out. And so that's what a poor relationship with feedback starts to look like. So, you know, listening to you, Alex, I, I, I'll admit, and I think others, even those who answered the poll and said that they had a healthy relationship with feedback, you know, there are definitely moments where feedback is difficult to receive and we want to avoid it or we don't want to hear it or we become defensive. So how could you recommend that we overcome that tendency that we might have to avoid feedback? Well, there's a, there's a neuroscience explanation and it's not just a be more open to it. I would say the first step is really understand how your brain's working and understanding it's not you, it's your brain. And a UCLA neuroscientist, he wrote a book that has a similar type of title and it's uh, abbreviated, but it's not you, it's your brain. And okay, well, what does that mean? Well, within your brain to use feedback, we talked about the executive brain, the prefrontal cortex. You know, it's why when you're trying to figure something out, you start rubbing your head and it feels like your brain hurts. There's, there's blood flow in there. It, it's trying to, trying to process this. And we talked about it doesn't have, the brain uses a lot of energy and to process things in a conscious way, uses even more energy. So that's why your brain hurts. But it's about, in, it's about using your executive brain. And one of the things that's a problem is the lower brain, also called the amygdala or the limbic system. And the thing about the lower brain is that that's on from the second we're born. When we start crying. That's our fight or flight um, mechanism where if we feel endangered, we're either going to fight or we're going to, fl- or going to, f- we're either going to fight or we're going to fly <laughs> and we're going to run. And our amygdala is, it's something that w- it's our emotional side. It's where we talked about those earlier photos with the anger and the denial. That's where the amygdala is firing. And one of the jobs of our executive brain is to put the brakes on the amygdala. But there's, there's a problem in that under constant stress, the, the, the resources of the frontal cortex, they start to be used up. And at a certain point, the executive brain just goes, okay, I've had enough. And it, it lets, let's go. And that's where the amygdala really comes out. And so it's, it's, and it's under chronic stress that the executive brain loses its capability to really control the amygdala. So understanding that and understanding stress, there's a lot of things you can do for, for stress and we don't have time to talk about it today, but more just understanding that if you're really stressed out, you're probably not going to respond well. Uh, Jeff Bezos just did a, a Q and a, and he talked about, Hey, I don't like to have uh, important meetings late in the day. I like to have them at 10 o'clock, not any earlier. I like to have, I need to go to bed early and I need to be rested. And if a big decision or issue comes up at the end of the day, he says, look, I gotta, we got to meet, meet and talk about this at 10 o'clock tomorrow because that's when I'm going to be in my best state. I don't know how many of you on the call have been late in the day. You're tired. There's a big issue. Your brain literally is like, look, I'm out of energy. Let's just make some decision and, and go home. Well, that's what leads to, to more problems and not using feedback in the most constructive way possible. 
That's helpful. Um, and I definitely am one who does best first thing in the morning with anything that uh, requires a lot of brain power. So I, I identify with that. Well, let's talk for a moment. Um, you know, we talked in the beginning about different tools that folks can implement and why feedback is an important component of this process. And I know, um, Alex, that you are a strong advocate for people working with business coaches. Can you tell us about why uh, that's so important and how leaders can choose the right coach? Sure. Well, why, why, why get a business coach? And it comes back to an earlier slide we talked about today. Our non-conscious is driving us. It is making a lot of decisions on its own. And we have a very small set of resources that are consciously thinking about things and questioning things. And that's where somebody else from the side can dedicate those resources and ask questions and engage that prefrontal cortex that is not naturally engaged. And so it just, it gets you out of, your brain is doing 99% of its stuff without even asking you. And so getting that perspective, someone holding the mirror up, somebody questioning things and helping you engage your executive brain, that's the number one reason to do it. Got it. So what about choosing the right one? That's where it depends on you. It depends on the leader. I've found with talking and watching coaches implement things, that some of them are very nurturing and some of them that they, they give them a kick in the, and you know what? And I was speaking with one, I'll never forget. I mean, she said, you know, I'm either their mother or I'm something else. And she's like, it just depends on what it takes for this person to really achieve, uh, to help them break the behavior patterns they're in, help them to, to use feedback in a positive way. So that's finding someone that, matches your style. I recommend that you'll, you'll probably come across business alignment tools in a presentation, someone presenting a system. They might be the right person for you. You can definitely find, and I can help you find, I'm happy to do that. You can find two or three other ones that can help you triangulate and make sure you have the right one. You want to make sure also they've got some experience because some of them are very well trained by the service providers, uh, the different concepts. However, they haven't really done it a number of times. They don't understand that a lot of people within dysfunctional organizations, they're fine with it. And they look at their number one job is getting rid of the person that's trying to imp help implement this. And so someone who's had that experience that knows how to be proactive, and make sure that the leader is fully bought into this before they bring it to the team because this process will expose any weaknesses and a lot of people would much rather maintain dysfunction. Now, there's a reason why there's so many people that have been involved in dysfunctional organizations. There's a lot of people that are fine with it. You know, I, I grew up as an only child in a relatively functional family. I'm not used to dysfunction, but I think sometimes people grow up and they're used to it. And so it's, it's a conscious effort to change that. Sure. Uh, we do have a question that came in from Gloria and she mentioned that she has found that most people feel that their own agenda is important. And when they're stuck on their own agenda, uh, it's difficult to figure out how to get around that. So do you have any recommendations on how to, how to deal with people that, you know, are really attached to their own agenda in the organization? That's where questions, real open questions and coming from a place of trying to find the right answer. And it's the way our brain's wired. Our brains are wired to, to when, when, we, when our own brain comes up with an insight, it tends to think that's it. That's the greatest insight. That's kind of how we're, that's how we're wired. We have a bias towards our own ideas. And engaging the executive brain, getting people to have good conversations about it, it's not easy. It's another reason that business coaches are helpful in that they help to get that dialogue going. It's one thing when two people that might be peers and maybe competitors within a company have two opposing viewpoints. It's another thing when a third party's just trying to help them find the best answer. What's the best way to align their efforts and that and making sure it's like, hey, it's about what's best for the company, not necessarily what's best for 
one person or what they think is best. That helps. Thank you. Um, and if you have any follow up to that, Gloria, feel free to put your question in the panel. We do have a few minutes uh, to take your questions, although I think Alex is going to summarize some takeaways. Um, so feel free to put those in the chat and I'd be glad to ask them. And I, I encourage you to keep staying through the questions because we have a really cool offer that I'm going to tell you about in just a few minutes. So let's talk about these takeaways. <laughs> the non, the non-conscious drives us. I spell that right. The not it, and we talked about it a number of times. There is our brain does a lot of things, makes a lot of decisions without even asking you. And it takes effort to coordinate our actions. It doesn't happen by accident. People don't get on those Disneyland canoe rides and go around the, the island in 10 minutes on their own unless they know how to coordinate their efforts. Um, it's going to be a mess and rather dysfunctional. But there are tools out there to help you align your team, your company, and they really boil down to asking important questions and using those answers to coordinate efforts. And finally, they require the use of feedback. And that's one of the things I talk about in my book in chapter two. If, if you don't have a good relationship with feedback, all these great business improvement tools aren't going to work for you. Save your time and money. A until you can develop a good relationship with feedback, it's not going to work. So I encourage you to, to find out and ask people around you. Ask people that, that can be honest with you and how do I handle feedback? Because a lot of times it's the bad feedback and people don't handle it well, people stop saying it. And you wanna ask the litmus test, now ask your spouse, you know, how do I handle negative feedback? And if they ask you with one eye like, are you sure you want the answer? That's probably a sign. Well, and Alex, before we started the call, you were mentioning that you're celebrating 19 years of marriage uh, today. It's your in anniversary a in a row. Happy anniversary to you. And uh, I bet your wife has been the one to uh, answer those tough questions for you. So I do have a couple questions before we go to sure. these uh, connect yeah. ideas. So um, Christine is mentioning, oh, shoot. Uh, I lost it. I'm going to have to scroll here a little bit. Some new ones came in. Um, how do you communicate feedback? to someone that may not be receptive to implementing change? Carefully. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not easy. It depends on the role. And people, what they're finding in the neuroscience and psychology is people have to feel safe in terms of really understanding that what you're saying to them is something that's trying to help them. When, it, when I give feedback to my daughter, when it's, short, when it's a little bit curt, she doesn't like it. And it's easy to, to already uh, create more emotion around it. So it's really important to take the time and make sure the relationship's there to give that. You can ask them, you know, are you open to feedback? When I first started speaking, I gave a, a talk to an executive group and I bombed. I mean, absolutely bombed. I mean, one of the guys put his head back and it just was like, oh, and we were only 10 minutes in. And one of my friends was in the audience. And the next day I talked to him, I called him and he said, you know, our, do you want to hear the feedback? Because it wasn't going to be good. I knew it wasn't going to be good and I wanted it, but he still asked. And so asking and developing the relationship that it can, that can come in a positive light, you have to take the time for it to be positive. Got it. Um, so here's a, more about feedback. So on the subject of feedback, could it be that poor feedback uh, becomes an issue when it comes to making important decisions? So could it become a good thing uh, to receive negative feedback because then you're more um, aware of what needs to be fixed in a company? Absolutely. And I'm really, there's a lot of feedback, a lot of discussion about feedback. Uh, now in the in the internet and that but there's a popular book out there called principles by ray dalio is one of the most successful fund managers and he talks about how taking some negative feedback uh the he got a letter a memo from his executive team 20 years ago 
and it said, you know, we like you, we know you're driving, you know, we know you're, you're working hard, you want us to be successful, but there's a lot of com- people in the company that they don't get you. They don't understand you. You, they, you belittle them. You don't mean to, but you do. It was a really tough memo that basically said, you do a lot of damage. And they said, we want to take you to dinner and we want to explain where we're at. And so he could have reacted a couple of different ways. He could have said, oh, you guys are wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. It's my business. Instead, he engaged them. And he said he, he used this negative feedback to change the way he was within the company. So that's, but he had to engage his executive brain to do that. A, a stressed out uh, executive brain that's dealing with the amygdala is like, that's one more thing. You guys are wrong. <laughs> that's not how he claims that he did it and built what, what uh, many have said is a very successful business. So a great comment here from Anita. She said, as a coach, she asks people to tell her first what feedback they would give themselves if they were an observer of their own life. And that will open them up to be more receptive to feedback from someone else. And oftentimes they'll ask you to give them feedback at that point. Uh, so that's a really great tip. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I encourage the same thing. I say, how do you think other people will will?" say your relationship with feedback is and you kind of you kind of go through that process and go okay let, let's go ask them mm-hmm. and, and that's where that's where it gets interesting and um it's a, a useful technique to say okay let's, let's go ask them well uh let's take a quick moment we're running out of time um i'm so thrilled that all of you have invested in this hour of learning with us i know i've been challenged i have a lot of new tools to consider using in my organization and uh, let's talk a little bit about how you can connect with alex after this event Uh, there are a few ways so you can find alex at his website alexvarobief.com you can subscribe to his podcast confidentroi.com you can follow him on twitter and we have a very special offer for those of you who are on today's call. Um, We have some copies of Transform Your Company in our office and Aubrey, our chat host, is going to put a link into the chat right now and you can uh, click the link and give us your name and mailing address. If you're in the continental U.S., we will ship you a print copy of Alex's book. Um, For international attendees, we may have some different arrangements in place and we'll communicate with you about those. Um, And we would always cherish your feedback about our webinar events and what you find valuable and what we could do to uh, to improve. So since we're talking about feedback, I would welcome you at any point to email me webinars at weavinginfluence.com. If you have feedback for Alex or if you have feedback for me, um, we would love to hear from you. Um, So if you would like to get a copy of the book, again, use that link in the chat. And uh, Aubrey, you need to reshare that to all the attendees, not to the panelists. For some reason, everybody's been chatting to the panelists today. Uh, Not so much public chat happening. So if you could reshare Aubrey with all the attendees, um, then you'll have a chance to click that link and get a copy of Alex's book. Alex, do you have any one uh, important piece of advice as we wrap up the call about the next best step that we can each take to transform our companies and escape frustration and align our business and get our lives back? (laughs) Uh, Be an observer. Observe things. Not It's easy for us just to be ingrained and again, it's that non-conscious brain. Observe things. Observe your company as though you are an outsider. Andy Grove recommended it with Intel and, and how they ran things. But imagine you're, you're an observer and, hey, does this, does this company, is it, is it dysfunctional? Uh, do, we, do we have answers to the important questions? And start asking questions in an honest, open way to try to drive a dialogue. Thanks so much, Alex. And thanks to all of you who have joined us today. Have a great Tuesday.